a lifetime of hard work, children laughing in the kitchen, family photos on a restaurant wall, a legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation, like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Well, well, well. Shopping for a car? Yep. Carvana made financing a car as smooth as can be. Oh, yeah? I got pre-qualified instantly and had real terms personalized just for me. Hmm. Doesn't get much smoother than that. Well, I got to browse thousands of car options on Carvana, all within my budget. Doesn't get much smoother than that. It does. I actually wanted a car that seemed out of my range, but I was able to add a cosigner and found my dream car. It doesn't get much... Oh, it gets smoother. It's getting delivered tomorrow. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get pre-qualified today. This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 3, for broadcast on the 10th of January, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, black holes controlling star formation in galaxies, the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, and over a quarter of the world's landmass to become significantly drier because of global warming. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a close correlation between the mass of a galaxy's central black hole and how quickly the galaxy shuts down star formation. Young galaxies blaze with bright new stars, forming at a rapid rate. It's what astronomers call starburst. But that star formation rate eventually shuts down or quenches as galaxies evolve. Every big galaxy has a central supermassive black hole, millions to billions of times the mass of our Sun. But these only reveal their presence through their gravitational effects on the galaxy stars, and sometimes by powering energetic radiation from an active galactic nucleus, or AGN. The energy pouring into a galaxy from its active galactic nuclei is thought to turn off star formation by heating and dispersing the very molecular gas and dust clouds that would otherwise cool and condense to form new stars. This idea has been around for decades, and astrophysicists have found that simulations of galaxy evolution must incorporate feedback from the black hole in order to reproduce the observed properties seen in real galaxies. But actual observational evidence of a connection between supermassive black holes and star formation has always been lacking. That is, until now. One of the study's authors, Professor Jean Brody from the University of California, Santa Cruz, says scientists have been dialing in feedback to make the simulations work out without really knowing how it happens. This is the first direct observational evidence where scientists can really see the effect of a black hole on the star formation history of the galaxy. The new results, reported in the journal Nature, reveal a continuous interplay between black hole activity and star formation throughout the galaxy's life, affecting every generation of stars formed as the galaxy evolves. The study, focused on massive galaxies, for which the central black hole's mass has been measured through previous observations by analysing the motions of stars near the galactic centre. To determine the star formation histories of galaxies, the authors analysed the detailed spectra of their light obtained by the hobby Eberly Telescope Massive Galactic Survey. Spectroscopy enables astronomers to separate and measure the different wavelengths of light from an object. The authors use computational techniques to analyse the spectrum of each galaxy and then recover its star formation history by finding the best combination of stellar populations to fit the spectroscopic data. Put simply, it tells you how much light is coming from different stellar populations of different ages. When they compared the stellar formation histories of galaxies with black holes of different masses, they found striking differences which correlated with the black hole's mass rather than galactic morphology, size or any other properties. So, for galaxies with the same mass of stars but different black hole masses at the centre, those galaxies with bigger black holes were quenched earlier and faster than those with smaller black holes. In other words, star formation lasted longer for galaxies containing smaller supermassive black holes at their centres. Other researchers have been looking for correlations between star formation and the luminosity of active galactic nuclei, but without success. That could be because timescales are so different. After all, star formation takes place over hundreds of millions of years, while outbursts from active galactic nuclei occur over far shorter periods of time. 
That's because a supermassive black hole only becomes luminous when it's actively gobbling up material from its host galaxy's inner regions. Active galactic nuclei are highly variable, and their properties depend on the size of the black hole, as well as the rate of accretion of new material falling into the black hole, and a whole bunch of other factors as well. The authors used black hole masses as a proxy for the energy being put into the galaxy by an active galactic nuclei. That's because accretion to more massive black holes leads to more energetic feedback from active galactic nuclei, which would therefore quench star formation faster. Mind you, the precise nature of the feedback from the black hole that quenches star formation remains uncertain. There are different ways that a black hole can put energy into a galaxy, and theorists have all kinds of ideas about how quenching happens. So, there's a lot more work to be done to fit these new observations into the models. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The United States military has confirmed the existence of a modern-day version of Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was a program run by the US Air Force during the 1960s. It was designed to deal with a flood of reports of flying saucers and other unidentified flying objects. Its real goal was to deflect attention away from classified military aircraft, such as occasional sightings of the U-2 spy plane and its eventual replacements, the CIA's A-12 Oxcart and its US Air Force SR-71 Blackbird counterpart. The A-12 and SR-71 became necessary after the Soviet Union developed surface-to-air missiles capable of shooting down U-2 aircraft flying at 70,000 feet. Both the A-12 and SR-71 used the same basic airframe and technology. They were both very fast, very high-flying reconnaissance aircraft capable of cruising at over 90,000 feet and flying in excess of Mach 3.2, fast enough and high enough to evade SAMs. The new version of Project Blue Book was the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. It was launched in 2007 following talks between Nevada Democrat Senator Harry Reid and his longtime friend Robert Bigelow. Bigelow is the founder of Bigelow Aerospace, which developed the experimental inflatable module now attached to the International Space Station. The company is also behind NASA's plans for the Deep Space Gateway Space Station project. That'll place a manned orbiting outpost between the Earth and Moon as a jumping-off point for missions to the lunar surface and eventually Mars. But Robert Bigelow's more than just an aeronautics and space visionary. He's also a firm believer in UFOs and intelligent alien civilizations having visited Earth. And the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program appears to be designed to gather evidence of such possible events, including aerial encounters by military pilots with UFOs. That's the aliens and the UFOs, not the military pilots. The program began in the Defence Intelligence Agency in 2007 with an initial five-year budget of $22 million. The program was formally terminated in 2012, but is understood to be continuing in one guise or another. Only one of their investigations has so far been released to the public. It contains audio and video recordings from the cockpit heads-up display of US Navy F-A-18 Super Hornets based aboard the USS Nimitz. The encounter, said to have taken place in the Pacific off the coast of San Diego in 2004, involved up to six FA-18s and two unidentified objects. One an unidentified flying object, the other submerged. The video includes both optical and infrared footage. The UFO looked like a glowing orb travelling at a high rate of speed. Its flight paths included both tight high-G turns and trajectories into the wind. And that's important because it rules out the possibility of these things being fluffy clouds. At one stage, the UFO was hovering and moving erratically about 50 feet out of the water, while the other object, described as being much larger than a submarine and directly below the water, was churning up the surface. Now, according to one of the Hornet pilots, the hovering object then flew directly towards the jets. And when one of the Super Hornets turned towards the unidentified aircraft, the object suddenly accelerated away. Later, the two Hornets were directed to a location 100 kilometres away where the same object had been detected on radar. However, the UFO had already disappeared by the time the Hornets arrived. The pilots described the UFO as wingless, white in colour and shaped like an oval oblong pill. Think of a Tic Tac. It was variously described as somewhere between 24 and 40 feet long, making it only slightly smaller than an FA-18, and it had no visible markings or glass. There are other reports which claim the object flew faster than 2,400 miles per hour, but unlike typical aircraft, it did not emit any hot exhaust. 
After returning to the Nimitz, the two Hornets were replaced by four other Hornets, this time equipped with forward-looking infrared sensors. This second flight of Navy aircraft also encountered the same UFO and recorded it on infrared video. It was the footage they captured which was later made available. Dude, there's a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. The whole thing, dude. That's not our LNS, though, is it? It's not. It is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. So, what are these objects? Well, if they're real, they probably represent a new generation of military drones being launched from submarines. But the fact is, what we actually saw in the video was little more than what's often referred to as a blob squatch. Now, blob squatches are unfocused shapes seen on video. They were originally named after those fuzzy objects often seen on almost every Bigfoot video. And the fact that it appeared to be moving and turning in unison with the aircraft's movements tends to point more towards them being some sort of optical artifacts. But to be honest, who really knows? To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Well, Fred, it had to happen one day we had to talk about UFOs. When you, I, I'm surprised that it's nearly two years and we've <laughs> managed to avoid the topic, but here we are. And, and it's based on a report that suggests that the Pentagon has been running uh, a secret multi-million dollar program to investigate UFOs, according to a report in the New York Times. So are they? Or aren't they? Well, the, the evidence seems to be that um, there that, that probably was some sort of operation. It, it's uh, said to have begun in 2007 and been closed down in 2012. The idea was, and I think this was raised by a senator who was actually the senator for Nevada. And of course, Nevada is where the famous Area 51 was. Yep. Uh, classified US Air Force base was, I think it still is there, and has been the centre of all kinds of speculation about what might have been found there and picked up there, and there's supposed to have been a, an alien space person. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, I'm shaking my head. I, I, have an, I have an alternative conspiracy theory. I think it's Nevada <laughs> tourism. <laughs> yeah, naturally. So let's make up a story that'll bring tourists. Boom, boom. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. But anyway, it was the senator for Nevada who kicked this off. Um, and it, it's come about because of a few reports that have come back from basically U.S. military personnel, most notably uh, airmen, and in fact, most notably Navy airmen or air persons, sorry, I should say, who have spotted objects behaving strangely in the Earth's atmosphere and within range of their sights. And um, it's not clear to me whether there is hard and fast radar evidence for these things. But they're talking about objects that fly at in, in incredible speeds at 80,000 feet and then, you know, in almost no time at all drop down to very close to the surface of the Earth that go at speeds that seem to defy any kind of propulsion mechanism that basically have manoeuvrability that would squash any human occupant because of the G-forces involved. So that's what sparked this thing off. They have documented, as far as we understand from the New York Times, what, uh, several curious incidents that are not explained. And basically, it's been wound up. It is said to have cost the Department of Defense something like about 20 million US dollars. That, that's in, about in 300 its... trillion Australian dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Sorry, I can't do the maths for that in my head. But you I might care. be slightly off on that calculation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was shut down. But apparently, the other side to this story is that it is still going on in the sense that people are still reporting sightings of unusual aerial phenomena and suspicious objects. So it had a name, this project, which we quite like. It was the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Programme, which tells you very much where the military is coming from on this. But as far as we understand, you know, it hasn't come up with any answers. It's just identified a lot of very unusual sightings. The ones I've looked at I found totally unconvincing. Uh, one or two were on the web. They look like blobs of light and often that's all UFOs are. The science world of course remains highly sceptical uh, because the the evidence is that for all we know about both physics and astrobiology, first of all, it seems very, it seems as though life as we know it is extremely rare, at least higher order life forms like ourselves. And also that the laws of physics 
do seem to apply pretty firmly throughout the universe. So things that can fly without wings or can defy gravity are you know, we remain skeptical about those. Of course, we're always we're always happy to learn. So if an alien came and gave us anti-gravity 101, we'd be delighted. Now, Fred, you and I have talked about the likelihood of um, intelligent extraterrestrial life. And I think we've both sort of come to the conclusion that it's probably not out there, um, given the age of the universe and where we're positioned in it and the the possibilities of of, uh, advanced development. But uh, we do agree that there will probably be microbial life to be found, probably within our solar system, within a very short period of time. But could we be wrong? Could there be intelligent life somewhere else out there absolutely and that's the you know that's the really niggling thing about this you can never prove that you're going to be wrong until some, something rocks up and does aerobatics in front of your airman and um, you know essentially um, shows off that uh, there are technologies but I think coming back to this particular venture I think it's really geared at trying to find out whether other foreign powers than the USA have got technology that the USA doesn't have yeah then uh, that's probably that's- more likely to be the answer, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. someone on Earth that's come up with a, a new concept and they're doing some test flights and, yeah, someone saw them. Simple. That Simple explanation. And, and usually the simplest explanation is likely to be the right one. Nevertheless, it's very intriguing. It's uh, intriguing. In fact, the senator who uh, kicked off this investigation, he tweeted something that says, if anybody says they have the answers, they're fooling themselves. We don't know the answers, but we've plenty of evidence to support asking the questions. This is about science, national security. If America doesn't take the lead in answering these questions, others will. So fairly robust response to people saying, why have you been wasting $20 million mm. on looking for UFOs? And, and 13 million pages worth of data, I think. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, incredible. All right, well, we'll watch with interest, but I doubt that anyone's going to tell us what's happening. (laughs) That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. And a new study warns that over a quarter of the world's landmass could become significantly drier if global warming reaches the 2 degrees Celsius increase predicted by scientists. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Climate Change, found that drier conditions would cause an increased threat of both drought and wildfires. Aridity, that is the aridness of a land surface, is a measure of the dryness of the land surface obtained by combining precipitation and evaporation. Scientists studied projections from 27 global climate models. They identified areas of the world where aridity will substantially change when compared to the year-to-year variations now being experienced. Aridification is a serious threat because it critically impacts areas such as agriculture, water quality and biodiversity. And of course, it also leads to more droughts and wildfires similar to those seen raging across California. The research predicts that aridification will emerge over some 20 to 30 percent of the world's total land surface by the time the global average temperature change reaches 2 degrees. And of course, it started already. Drought severity has been increasing across the Mediterranean, southern Africa and the east coast of Australia while semi-arid areas in Mexico, Brazil, southern Africa and the Australian outback have encountered increased desertification as the world has warmed. Scientists say areas of the world which would benefit most from keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius are parts of Southeast Asia, Southern Europe, Southern Africa, Central America and Southern Australia, a region where more than 20% of the world's population lives today. If you're a pessimist, you probably already know this, but uh, a new study has confirmed that bad people really do win. 
Researchers found that adolescents who are willing to exploit others for personal gain are more likely to bully other people, but they're also likely to have more sex than people who score higher in areas such as honesty and humility. The findings are reported in the Journal of Evolutionary Psychological Science. Researchers found that bullying might be more than just objectionable behaviour. It might have evolved as a way for men to show dominance and strength and to signal to women that they're good breeding stock, able to protect their offspring and provide for their needs. The study suggests that from an evolutionary perspective, a man's dominance may make him more attractive to his potential sexual partners, as well as scaring off potential rivals. To reach their conclusions, researchers gathered two sets of participants, 144 older teenagers with an average age of around 18 and 396 younger teens with an average age of 14. Participants had to fill in questionnaires about their sex life, the number of sexual partners, as well as the frequency of bullying perpetration. Through a separate questionnaire, researchers then learnt more about six different aspects of the participants' personalities, such as their willingness to cooperate with others or to exploit and antagonise others. The latter was measured by looking at how agreeable and emotionally in tune someone is, as well as how honest and humble they are. Those who did not score high in these latter categories tend to display antisocial personality traits and subsequently were bullies. The researchers found that exploitative younger adolescents who scored lower in honesty and humility were also more likely to use bullying tactics or strategically manipulate weaker individuals in order to pursue more sexual partners. The scientists also found that adolescents lower in honesty and humility also used bullying as an intersexual strategy in order to display traits such as strength and dominance in order to attract the opposite sex. A new study warns that the popularity of energy drinks and junk food may have unique risks for teenagers who consume too much of birth during the latest stages of brain development. The findings, reported in the Journal of Birth Defects Research the Teenage Brain, examine the risk effects of taurine, caffeine and energy drinks on the adolescent brain. Researchers conclude that not only is the rise in energy drink consumption, often mixed with alcohol among teens, alarming, but studies show high taurine levels can result in adverse effects on learning and memory and increased alcohol consumption in females. A separate study found that junk food's not only bad for waistlines, but also bad for the teenage brain. Scientists say that's because key neurotransmitter systems in the brain, which are responsible for inhibition reward signaling, are still developing during the teen years. And existing primarily on junk food could negatively affect decision-making, increase reward-seeking behaviour and influence poor eating habits throughout adulthood. Paleontologists have discovered exceptionally well-preserved fossils from a strange new species of semi-aquatic theropod dinosaur related to Velociraptor. The 75-million-year-old fossils of Halzacoraptor esculii were discovered in Cretaceous-level strata at a dig site in southern Mongolia. The new find shares the sickle-shaped killer claws on its feet common to other velociraptors. But it also possessed a strange swan-like neck and flipper-like forelimbs, giving it an unexpected mix of features for an aquatic lifestyle. Scientists also found numerous teeth preserved inside the mouth and a neurovascular mesh inside the snout resembling those of modern crocodiles. The fossil represents a new genus and species of amphibious dinosaur. It walked on two legs on land, with postural adaptions similar to short-tailed birds like ducks. But it used flipper-like forelimbs to manoeuvre through the water like penguins, and probably relied on its long neck for foraging and ambush hunting. A new study has found that storytelling was used in ancient times to promote cooperation in hunter-gatherer communities prior to the introduction of organised religion. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, shows that hunter-gatherer storytellers were essential in promoting cooperative and egalitarian values before comparable mechanisms evolved in larger agricultural societies such as moralising high gods. Researchers based their findings on studies of the Agata hunter-gatherer group, descendants of the first colonisers of the Philippines more than 35,000 years ago. They found storytellers were even more popular than the best food gatherers, having greater reproductive success and were more likely to obtain cooperation from other members of the tribe. Scientists also found that 70% of the sample of 89 stories gathered from seven different hunter-gatherer societies concerned reinforcing and regulating social behaviour. The stories appear to coordinate group behaviour and facilitate cooperation by providing individuals with social information about the norms, rules and expectations in a community. And finally for now, a sceptic's guide to ghosts. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking, 
It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a steaming pile of woo. That's what skepticism is all about. It's a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. In folklore, ghosts, apparitions, spooks, spirits, spectres, poltergeists, phantoms and wraiths are all manifestations of the soul of a deceased person. For many, they provide an important light at the end of the tunnel, pointing to something more than death simply being a final absolute ending. They can also provide psychological comfort at a time of immense sadness following the death of a dearly loved family member or friend. And so it can come down to a question of faith, a need to believe that there's something more to life than simply hard work, decay, entropy and a grave. To provide validation, even justification for that faith, people will go to extraordinary lengths to contact spirits in the afterlife. And sadly, be it Ouija boards, tarot cards, crystal balls, seances or channeling, there are plenty of charlatans, con artists and fraudsters out there more than willing to help for a price. And just as important as contacting the spirit world is the need to get rid of the troublesome spirit, poltergeist or demon. And that's where exorcisms and ghost hunters can come in. If there's a haunting somewhere, there's someone willing to tackle it. You see, ghosts can be all about control, either your sadness, your faith or your money. Despite centuries of investigation, sadly there's still no scientific evidence that ghosts are real. Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics, is a regular contributor to the space-time program. And he joins us now to take a look at ghosts. People want the afterlife to exist. It provides some continuity. Fear of death is something that is universally human. And I think that's just one way of uh, thinking about a future, even if you know that sometimes, you know, at some point in the future, your life will end. Are ghosts the same in all cultures or are there differences? No, there are definitely differences. Ghosts are very culture specific in their manifestations. And that is actually one of the probably red flags around ghosts. It's something we also see with UFOs, where UFOs are quite specific to a culture. We we also see in even within Western culture that movies will affect the way ghosts are perceived. You know, after The Exorcist came out, people were seeing manifestations of ghosts that were fitting with demonic possession. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of evil ghosts around in places in the U.S., for example, where there were big battles during the Revolutionary War. The, the people tend to see soldiers from the Revolutionary time. So it is very culture specific. The Hollywood genre hasn't helped that either with everything from Ghostbusters at one end of the scale through to things like Blair Witch and as you said The Exorcist and Amityville Horror all that sort of stuff it sort of piles on and it's amazing how many people including friends of mine really do believe in an afterlife and a spirit world yes yeah, so I think there's, there's a bit of a difference between believing in the afterlife and believing in ghosts because the afterlife can be something that is not substantial however a belief in ghosts it goes one step further and it says that the people who have died are here with us and are detectable by us and we have this genetic generic ghost figure of a wispy human shape that is able to walk through walls and other solid objects. So, and I should point out that it's not new. Uh, descriptions of ghosts appear in, in old Egyptian wall paintings. They appear in definitely medieval times. But they go back hundreds and thousands of years. So ghosts are not a new thing. And But in every culture along the way, in every culture through time, they manifest manifested in a way that was suitable for that culture. Of course, for those who believe in that sort of thing, that's going to be a, uh, a sign that it must be true. The fact that all these different separated cultures all have the same sort of belief. They may see it slightly differently to suit their cultural requirements, but nevertheless, it's they all see the same thing. There must be some truth in it. Surely that's the that's the line they're going to give you. Well, that's exactly the point. They don't see the same thing. So they all call it ghosts, but they're not the same thing. They very much are culture dependent. There are definitely common themes, but the differences are usually more profound than the, uh, the similarities. The common theme is essentially the fact that these are dead people that we see with us. But, for example, again, as we mentioned earlier, in modern times, we think of them as those wispy figures that go through walls. That was not the case in the past. In the past, there were solid objects. They looked like humans who are visiting us. So, in a sense, what we would now describe as zombies, perhaps. So, this whole idea of ghosts being a universal phenomenon is tainted a bit by the fact that there really are 
different across times and places. There's a bit of a resurgence in uh, ghosts or ghost culture in recent times since the advent of reality TV because there's a plethora of ghost hunting shows. In fact, I believe in the US there is a ghost hunting channel, cable channel dedicated to ghost hunting where you see ghost hunters and I use square quotes here. Unfortunately, it's not a visual medium, but they definitely don't hunt anything. But there are, as I said, channels that are dedicated completely to ghost hunting. And what you have there is people walking around, usually at night. It's important that it be dark because it's more scary. And they carry scientific equipment such as sensitive thermometers, uh, EMF meters. Uh, EMF is electromagnetic frequency. Recording devices that detect something called electronic voice phenomena. An electromagnetic free, you're saying a radio. It's essentially a radio. It's essentially a radio. It's just a weak radio with not a very good reception. Um, so the thing is, all of these things sound sciencey and sound like they're reasonable, but of course they're not. And I can say with a fair degree of confidence that ghosts are not real. Well, to most of our listeners, I'm sure that sounds like a perfectly logical statement to make. But what are some of the reasons that you have for making that statement? OK, so first of all, let's look at the numbers. The number of people who have died in all of history is estimated at around 100 billion. That means there should be a lot of ghosts around. We'd be um, pretty yet, crowded in heaven and hell. Yes, it would be, would be very crowded. Yet we, very few people actually report seeing them. However, that's probably not a very strong argument because one could argue that maybe not all dead people become ghosts and maybe ghosts are recycled, you know, like the, the, the spirit goes into another person. So... Um, reincarnation. Yeah, so it does require an explanation. So, but let's take that as a given. Another thing to note is that ghosts have clothes, and it's not entirely clear why they have clothes. I mean, are the clothes dead as well? Are those the clothes that were wearing when they died? Did the clothes go to heaven or wherever it is with them? I mean, it's quite uh, easy to explain why it's convenient for the person telling the story, or you know, if they don't have to describe a naked person, but the clothes don't really make any sense at all from the perspective of what we think a ghost is, which is the manifestation of a dead person. There is something called in modern ghost sighting, there is something called an orb, which is basically a ghost that appears in a photo, but it was not visible to the photographer. Orbs are great because as anybody who knows anything about photography, there's a lot of things that come out when you use a flash or photography exposes all kinds of things that people don't see with their naked eyes. That's why we use photographs very often. Ghosts are simply an artifact of flash photography and while a lot of ghost photos show orbs they do not show ghosts they simply show an, an effect from photography so if ghosts are these not quite solid things that can pass through walls how do they make sounds well it is not entirely clear they're supposed to you see they're supposed to walk through walls which means that they do not interact with matter at least not in the usual way however they do make sounds they do change temperatures or at least um, you know so the, the claim go. They make doors slam and books fall off shelves. They actually, even if you think of it, you know, the fact that we can see them means that they interact with photons. So, you know, photons hit them and bounce back, yet at the same time, they can then walk through walls. There is a contradiction there that, of course, cannot be explained by those who believe that ghosts are real. I guess they could be neutrinos, which are very weakly interactive, or, or maybe dark matter, which we don't fully understand. Dark matter would be a great excuse for a ghost, wouldn't it? I mean, we know nothing about dark matter other than we know it's real. Well, we do know one thing, and that is that um, people who believe in all kinds of woo uh, will very often use quantum and its weirdness as an excuse for why they believe in this or that. So absolutely, I would say quantum is a good explanation for ghosts. It's quantum. That's ghost. why there are ghosts. They're quantum. Yeah, but there's, there's actually one, one very important thing that I think is the, probably the most scientific explanation as to why I do not believe in ghosts, and that is the fact that ghosts are supposed to be endowed with the personality and memories of a person that the, the person that they once were. But science has shown conclusively that personality and memories are a product of the brain, and when the brain is damaged or gone, so are the personality and memories. So, in a very real sense, we know that the brain is the seat of the soul, even if you don't like the use of the word soul in its, in its uh, spiritual sense. What we consider to be the soul of the person is seated in the brain and the 
soul dies when the brain dies. So there's really nothing, nothing to pass on to uh, to the world beyond beyond us when we die. There are some uh, great ghost stories, I guess. Well, ghost-like stories. The one I like is leaving the body during an operation and looking down at the operating table and looking down at yourself being operated on. There have been specific experiments where they hid playing cards on top of cabinets in the operating theater so that anything floating above would see them and the hit rate was exactly zero. So so that was an actual experiment. That was not kind of um, something that was, how should I say it? It was not uh, something that some surgeon thought about and that, that thought that would be funny. It was an actual experiment provided that was conducted by experimenters who wanted to find out whether out-of-body experience is actually real. What about putting your money where your mouth is? Are there cash deals for anyone who can prove a ghost exists? Absolutely. The Australian Skeptics $100,000 challenge is there for anybody who can prove that ghosts exist or in fact anything that is paranormal under test conditions. The thing is I would ask anybody who's listening to this who is so inclined to not send us fake photos that can easily be shown to be manipulated or taken using photographic effects. We know all about these. We know how to detect them. Do a little bit better. But we are always interested in things that uh, at least at first blush appear to be real and we will investigate them. But again, to win $100,000 you need to have strong evidence for your claim. But I must say that uh, Australian skeptics uh, in particular but the, the, the skeptical world in general has moved on a bit from ghost claims except as a gateway to critical thinking. You know, there's really the harm from ghost stories is actually quite minimal. Of course, people make money out of them and all kinds of things like that but the main harm from a belief in ghosts is the poor thinking that comes from believing in ghosts. The fact that you believe in something for which there is so little evidence and is so unlikely to begin with, it's just something that we would prefer people to not fall for that but but in terms of the actual harm it's minimal and we don't spend a lot of time on ghosts nowadays that's Aran segev president of australian skeptics you're listening to space time i'm Stuart gary and that's the show for now you can subscribe and download space time as a free twice weekly podcast through apple podcast itunes stitcher bytes.com pocket casts soundcloud youtube audio boom from spacetimewithstuartgary.com or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 